Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Arturo Cobos. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a great pleasure for us to host this webinar on which we will review different techniques about approaches about clipping of vascular artery aneurysms with the best vascular neurosurgeons in the world. It's very nice to see so many neurosurgeons here. I'm sure we will learn a lot from our guests. I hope you enjoy these lectures. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Luis Rodoñez, who is in the vascular neurosurgeon in our group and who is in coordination with me this webinar. Thank you so much, Luis. Thank you. I want to present our first professor. Uh, he is uh, Professor Fede Chadar Neto. He's professor of the of neurosurgery in the University of Sao Paulo. Um, professor uh, in the vascular neurosurgery in the UNIFESP, and also uh, on the course uh, course of neurology in the UNIFESP. Uh, he is a chief of a labora uh, anatomic and microsurgical laboratory in the UNIFESP and coordinator of uh, neurosurgery in the Hospital Beneficencia Portuguesa in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Professor Ferres, uh, thank you very much and you can start now. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Dr. Arturo and Luis for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate with Dr. Zlatan and Christine this, on this webinar. Uh, I'm going to talk about approaches to basilar tip aneurysms. Uh, this is my team in University and Beneficencia Portuguesa Hospital. Uh, I am very proud to show you my lab at UNIFESP. Uh, we have many courses during the year with cadaveric head and brain dissection and lab uh, surgeries. Uh, this is my lab in, at Federal University of São Paulo, UNIFESP, Brazil. Uh, we hope to see you soon in your courses. Uh, there are three types. Uh, I'm going to speak very fast because of time. Uh, there are three types uh, of basilar tip bifurcation, and they are performed on a different way for each type. The, the way the normal bifurcation, the B, the high riding bifurcation, and the C, the low riding bifurcation. Uh, uh, we must remember that the posterior cerebral artery coursed over the third nerve all the time. All the time. Uh, 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 we have to consider a few factors to determine which is the type of the bifurcation the place of the bifurcation, the direction of the PCA and the relation of the clivus and the, 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 the bifurcation. Uh, uh, the normal bifurcation uh, uh, is the one located in the pontum mesencephalic sulcus, and the both segments of PCA have a straight direction, and its location is, is close to the bursum cilla. We can see the relation between the PCA and per nerve, uh, 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 we can, uh, 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 the low riding bifurcation is placed at the level of the pons, with the both segment of the PCA courses ascending and going above the third nerve. Its location is below the dorsal cilla. Uh, 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 the high riding bifurcation uh, uh, is located in the interpeduncular fossa, and the PCA has a descending direction. Its location is above the dorsal cilla. Uh, the relation between the, the PCA and the third nerve, uh, 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 here we have the correlation of the basilar bifurcation, the related stretch and the craniorum for each one. The high riding bifurcation, the bifurcation is in interpeduncular fossa. The PCA has the same direction, the OZ craniorum. The normal bifurcation is in the ponto mesencephalic sulcus. The PCA has a straight direction and the pretemporal craniorum. In the low riding bifurcation, the bifurcation is in pons. And the PCA has a same direction and the pretemporal craniorum. The PCON. Uh, uh, the posterior communicating artery uh, arises from the ICA and connects the ICA with the PCA, separating the P1 segment medially and the P2 laterally. There are three types of the posterior communicating artery, fetal, 
adults and the hypoplastic. The adult pecone is when the caliber of the pecone is larger than one millimeter, and the blood flow of the PCA depends on the basilar artery. The adult pecone pattern is shown in the angiogram. Uh, and the MRI here, we can see the pecone. Uh, 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 here, uh, uh, we can see the fetal pecone, which the flow of the P2, P3, P4 depends on the ICA. We can see this angiogram. The vertebral basilar angiogram shows us that there is no blood flow coming from the basilar artery. It's here. Uh, 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 here, uh, uh, are able to see in this MRI that the right side has a hypoplastic pecon and the left side has a fetal pecon. Here in the surgery, I can see the pecon artery anterior talon perforating arteries through the optic carotid space. Uh, it's the optic carotid space or triangle. Uh, in conclusion, the pecon artery has three types. The adult pecon, the blood flow comes from the basilar artery to the PCA, the fetal pecon, the blood flow comes from the ICA to the PCA. P1 is hypoplastic. In the hypoplastic pecon, the blood flow comes from the basilar artery to PCA. The spaces or triangles. Uh, 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 there are the following the natural corridors in the brain. Supraoptic, optic carotid, carotid oculomor, oculomor of free border of tentor and supraoptic. The supraoptic uh, uh, is located above the optic nerve and chiasm. He is in the surgery, use this space to perform the fenestration of lamina terminalis. Here, uh, we see the fenestration of the lamina terminalis. So, the supracarotid space is limited medially by A1, laterally by, laterally by M1, and the, 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 the posterior by anterior perforator substance. Uh, the supracarotid space, uh, the, the, there is an obsta obstacle uh, to use this space, the lenticular strike arteries. Through this space, we are able to see the basilar tip region. The optocarotid space. Uh, the optocarotid space is limited immediately by optic nerve and chiasm the lateral, uh, laterally by the ICA and the posterior by A1. Uh, through this space, you are able to see the TCON, the anterior talon perforating arteries, and the pituitary stalk. Also, the contralateral ICA, the third nerve, and the floor of the third ventricle. Here, we can see the fetal PICON and the anterior perforating arteries. Uh, the current oculomoral space uh, is the best space for basilar tip aneurysm surgery. This space is limited medially by ICA, laterally by third nerve, and the posterior by anterior part of the ankles. Through this space, we are able to see both P1, both third nerves, pecon, superior cerebellar arteries. Most, most of the times, the posterior clinic process can also be seen. We use this space to do the posterior clinoid process in some operations, and uh, we may need to widen these spaces. The supraclinoid ICA, internal carotid artery, is fixed by two points, the pecon and the distal dural ring. The enlarge the carotid oculomor space, we perform a few steps. The first step, we move up the internal carotid artery. We can see both P1 here, both P1, both superior cerebellar artery, both third nerves. Uh, uh, we can see here the pecon and the anterior talon perforated arteries and the basilar tip aneurysm. Here, uh, just a moment. Then, uh, if the view is not good, we perform the second step. The second step is to cut 
the PCOM, we cut it close to the PCA because 80% of the anterior talon perforates are located close to the ICA. I'm cutting the, piece, the, the, the posterior communicating artery here. Uh, 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 after the PCO is cut, we can see the basilar, P1, aneurysm, third nerve, posterior talon perforating arteries. The third uh, step to enlarge the carotid oculomoral space is the intradural anterior clinoidectomy. The anterior clinoid process is fixed on three points. The lesser sphenoid link, the plumo sphenoideo, and the optic stretch. All, all uh, uh, of my work was covered of operative neurosurgery. How do I remove the anterior clinoid process? I prefer to remove it, uh, it by performing an intradural and the one block. The first step, I remove the dura mater. I cut parallel to the optic nerve. After that, I cut transverse to the optic nerve. And in the last step, I cut the lateral part of the ACP. Then I drew the three points, last sphenoid wing, plumb sphenoid wing, and the optic stretch. I'm drilling the optic stretch because the optic stretch is, is below the optic nerve. Next, I, I, I remove the ICP in one block so the clinoid segment of the ICA can be seen from now on. Uh, uh, the clinoid segment uh, of the ICA is located between the distal dura ring and the proximal dura ring. The clinoid segment is here. We can see the third nerve. It's the astradural segment. Uh, uh, the next step is to open the optical nerve shift. I optical up nerve shift parallel to the optic nerve. Uh, 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 because the ophthalmic artery runs inferior and lateral to the optic nerve. If I cut transversal, I can damage the ophthalmic artery. We can see the distal dura ring. I'm exposing the ophthalmic artery. At this point, I cut the distal dura ring around the ICA to the clinoid segment with the ophthalmic segment of connecting to, uh, uh, to the clinoid segment with the ophthalmic segment of the ICA. Uh, the, uh, the fourth step is open the oculomoral triangle. Uh, 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 and I make a stitch to pull anyway, uh, uh, anyway to uh, the third nerve to widen the carotid oculomoral space. Uh, 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 the last space uh, we have to talk about uh, uh, is the third nerve free edge of the tentorium, which is limited immediately by the third nerve is here, third nerve is here. And the lateral by free edge of tentorium and fourth nerve. The more free edge of tentorium, we can use it for low riding basilar tip aneurysm. We can see the superior part of the pons through this space and the fourth nerve. I make a stitch at the free board of tentorial edge and pull it to enlarge this space. The space. How do I choose the side to perform the operation? I have to analyze some factors. The pick on type. I prefer to operate on the side where it's the adult pick on or the hypoplastic pick on is placed. A second factor is if there are multiple aneurysms, we will have to approach on the side with more aneurysms. Here we can see in the surgery, uh, uh, one very important factor is that my skillful hand 
is the left hand. So I prefer to operate on the left side. I, I learned with Dr. Oliveira. Uh, uh, it's very, uh, was very important for him. Uh, uh, the other important factor is choose the same side of the oculomotor palsy. How do I choose the side? So I consider all these factors to perform surgery. Which one is the best approach? I don't make the, the teronal approach for basilar uh, uh, tip aneurysms anymore. Nowadays, I perform the pretemporal approach for basilar tip aneurysms with the normal and low riding bifurcation and the OZ for high riding bifurcation tip aneurysms. And we can see a normal basilar tip bifurcation with an aneurysm. We use the pretemporal craniotomy for this lesion. This craniotomy has the objective of exposing the temporal lobe, allowing the transylvian subtemporal and temporal uh, uh, approach, temporopolar approach at once. Uh, and we can see a low basilar tip bifurcation with an aneurysm. We characterize the low basilar tip bifurcation by analyzing superior direction of the both P1 segment of the PCA in the anteroposterior projection of the angiogram. We also use the pretemporal craniotomy for the lesion. The pretemporal craniotomy was described by Dr. Evandro de Oliveira. Uh, we can go over, over the temporal uh, lobe, which is called the transceiver approach. Or we go under the temporal lobe, the subtemporal approach that allows us to have a lateral view. We are able to see the relation between the aneurysm and the posterior column perforated arteries. The temporal polar approach is an uh, aspect that we pull back the anterior part of the temporal lobe. This access allows us to have the anterolateral view. We are able to see both P1 here, both P1s, both third nerves, both the SCA, both P cones, the posterior clinoid process. While the endotheronal approach, the center of the, uh, the vision is the ICA. In the pretemporal approach, the center vision uh, views are of the internal carol d'Award and the third nerve. I have it right in the sylvian fissure downwards. Uh, uh, for a high riding basilar tipian aneurysm, I perform the orbitozygomatic approach, uh, which allows me, allows me to have a view of the inferior aspects of the brain. This type of the aneurysm is in touch with the floor of the third ventricle. Therefore, I need to extend the head after that. The orbit is in my work field. So I remove the orbit. This is the step-by-step -step of the OZ approach. Uh, I show the removal of the orbit. Uh, this is the final view. So now I'm going to, uh, to show some cases. Uh, the first case, in this case, I use the OZ approach for high riding, for high riding bifurcation of the basilar tip aneurysm. I dissect, I'm dissect the sylvan fissure. The carotid cistern, the, the optic carotid cistern, the third nerve, uh, I, uh, I expose the optic carotid space, carotid oculomor space, and you open the Lilyquist membrane. Uh, I coagulate the bridging vein that drains to the sphenoidal parietal sinus. This allows us to retract the anterior part of the temporal lobe posterior. Here, I coagulate, I'm coagulating and cutting the picon close it to the posterior cerebral artery to mobilize the uh, uh, ICA. During the dissection uh, of the aneurysm, we have an intraoperative eruption. 
we use a temporary clip in the basilar artery stopping the bleeding. The aneurysm is separated from the ipsilateral P1 and the aneurysm clipping with performance. The next case is the low riding uh, uh, bifurcation aneurysm, low, low riding tip, uh, basilar tip aneurysm. Uh, in this case, we perform all the techniques for low uh, basilar tip aneurysm. I am dissecting the Sylvan fissure. I am fenestrating the lamina terminalis. And we can see the internal carotid artery, A1, A1, the super optic, the super carotid space. I am coagulating the bridging veins. I am coagulating and cutting the posterior communicating artery to move up the internal carotid artery. The next step, step sorry, the next step, I, I, I perform the intradural anterior clinoidectomy, parallel to the optic nerve transverse to the optic nerve, parallel to the lateral surface of the anterior clinoid process. Did you uh, remember the anterior clinoid process fixed in three points? The last is phenoid wing, plano is phenoideo, optic stretch. I am drilling the optic stretch because it's uh, uh, below the optic nerve. And the eye, uh, 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 I am removing, I am removing the, 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 the anterior clinoid process in block. Uh, uh, I am uh, putting uh, uh, the fibrin glue. I learned with Dr. Quist. Uh, I open the posterior part of the roof of the cavernous sinus. I pull back the anterior part of the temporal lobe. I make a stitch lateral to the third nerve to enlarge the uh, carotid oculomotor space. I put, I'm putting the fibrin glue in the cavernous sinus and I expose the posterior clinoid process. I am removing the posterior clinoid process and drilling. And then we can see the aneurysm. I am separate the aneurysm from the P1, the both P1. I am clipping. Another clip. I'm going to punch it, the aneurysm and I'm cut, cutting the aneurysm. I can see the posterior talon perforating arteries now. Uh, I, I check the with the vascular doppler. The next case is a, 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 a low riding basilar uh, bifurcation aneurysm uh, with a, 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 a posterior communicate to aneurysm too. The only approach was performed for upper basilar. I am really the anterior clinoid process. I am removing the anterior clinoid process. I dissect the pico aneurysm and I clip it. I check uh, the picum uh, blood flow with vascular copper. I'm stitching, I'm, I, I'm making a stitch, the free board of tentori, and I, I'm opening the roof of the cavernous sinus medially of the third nerve. 
and I'm clipping the basilar tip anyways. And check if vascular doper. Uh, pause operative and just city. The next case, the case. Sorry. The next case. We have a big ophthalmic aneurysm and the normal basilar tip aneurysm. The pretemporal approach was performed. We are dissecting, open the, the scissors. We can see the ICA, the bifurcation, the carotid bifurcation. Now, I, I perform the uh, intradural anterior clinoidectomy. We can see the optic nerve, I'm breathing. I'm removing three points. I'm removing block. I cut parallel the optic shift, parallel the optic nerve. We can see the internal carotid artery, the anterior cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery. Now, uh, 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 I ha uh, the temporary clip in the ophthalmic segment of the internal carotid artery. I clip the ICA aneurysm. After that, I punch the, and aspirate the aneurysm. Now, I coagulate and cut the posterior clinoid process. I'm doing the posterior clinoid process. I'm dissecting the third nerve. We can see the pecon artery. I'm cut, coagulating and cutting the pecon closely to the PCA and move up. The interior carotid pro, the 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 internal carotid artery, and I am dissecting the aneurysm. Okay, we can see the the mammary bodies of the uh, uh, roof uh, roof of the floor of the third ventricle. The posterior talon perforating arteries are free. The next case, oh sorry, the next case. The next case, we show left with temporal approach. We use the temporal polar. I'm dissecting the, the, the all systems. Sylvia Fisher, carotid system, uh, uh, optic uh, chiasm system. We can see the internal carotid artery, third nerve. I am coagulating and cutting the bridging veins. I pull back the anterior part of the temporal lobe, the temporal polar root. We can see the picon, third nerve. I'm drilling the posterior clinoid process. We can see the third nerve. I'm coagulating and cutting the posterior. Uh, uh, communicating artery and move up the ICA. We can see the contralateral third nerve and I am clipping the aneurysm, the anterior aneurysm. But I can't choose for a uh, clip in the posterior aneurysm. I'm going to, I am coagulating and cutting the aneurysm.
and cutting. After that, we can see both P1, both third nerve. And now I am clipping the posterior aneurysm. Okay, and one more for a finish. Just a moment. One for finish is the, the best case for me. Sorry. Oh no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, last case. This case, uh, a partial thrombos and partial embolized the aneurysm, tip aneurysm with mass effect. We did a paramedium frontal craniotomy. We use the interhemispheric transcaloso transcoroidal approach. We achieve the aneurysm inside the third ventricle. I am dissecting the callosal One minute. System. Okay, okay, okay. I'm dissecting the pericolosal artery. And I remove the single gyrus. And after that, I expose, I remove the uh, corpus callosum. Here, we can, uh, I reach the aneurysm. We use the ultrasound aspiration and piecemeal removal until we see the coils. We did this case in a hybrid OR with endovascular proximal control. The objective of this surgery was to reduce the mass effect. We can see the coils, it's finished the surgery. It's over. The control. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Arturo. Uh, your friendship is very important for me. And uh, Professor Evandro Oliveira is my mentor taught me neuroanatomy, neurosurgical uh, techniques, and my master tricks. I am very grateful. Uh, in conclusion, uh, microsurgery is still an option. The, combine, uh, the combination of the microsurgical techniques with anatomical knowledge make it feasible. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much for this amazing lecture. Can you stop sharing your screen, please? Okay. Dr. Chris, can you share your screen, please? Well, it's a great honor for me to introduce Dr. Ali Christ. Dr. Chris, our areas of expertise are cerebrovascular, pituitary tumors, and skull-based tumors. Dr. Chris is the director of our Arkansas Neuroscience Institute, director of the cerebrovascular and neuroendocrine clinics, and is the chief of is the chief editor of the contemporary neurosurgery. Dr. Chris, thank you so much for accepting this invitation. You are welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you, Arturo, you and your team for putting this together. And good to be among friends for, with uh, Ferris and uh, Michael. Um, and uh, this is a dear subject to me, talking about basal aneurysms. And I thought of the title to, to be the path to basal apex and using the cavernous sinus route to approach it. But before proceeding, I'd like to make some points regarding aneurysms in general and basilar 
Apex Seniors in particular. I would like to share this uh, new institute that uh, we moved into last year. This is our research and education uh, center, which is the Yazagi Research Education Center. This is our hospital, which is a, a neuroscience institute, and this is our rehab behind it. And I'm putting this because uh, over the years I had a lot of fellows from Mexico. Actually, last we counted was getting close to 200. So this is the MG Yazagil Neurosurgical Research and Education Center. And uh, this is our auditorium where our fellows usually stay during the day and it's connected with the with the operating room with a 3d system to that's where they watch the surgery and that's what where we do our educational conferences and this is also uh, has the uh, lmft micro neurosurgery laboratory which is uh, can take up to 50 participants and uh, we've already had many courses and hopefully once everybody is safe and sound after we're done with the, with the coronavirus that you are all welcomed here. I'm eager to have my friend uh, Michael Lawton as one of our guests pretty soon. And uh, this is the Evandro de Oliveira conference room because Evandro gave so many lectures in this conference rooms over the years. Uh, bless his heart, and I hope every one of you send him his prayers, your, your prayers, and a lot of good wishes. I'm always in touch with him, and actually I got a, a text message from him yesterday. I keep sharing my cavernous sinus uh, work with him. So, uh, you are all welcome anytime. Uh, and like I said, we have a, an, an open a chest and open heart uh, to promote micro neurosurgery, which is badly needed nowadays. I wanted to show this. This is May 19, which was yesterday, from one of my previous uh, fellows, who is one of uh, the most prominent really neurosurgeons in in uh, Holland, uh, Ruben Dahmer. And if you look at uh, the subject. It's another horrible coil case. That's how he sends it. And he sends me this case, which was a very nice clippable aneurysm, as you see on the top right side, was coiled and then coiled two times after it's grown. And now it's grown further. Patient is having problems because this is digging into hypothalamus and uh, the brainstem. And now they told him he needs to do something about it. And he called me yesterday on WhatsApp, and we had to sit down and discuss, unfortunately, this miserable uh, situation uh, to deal with. So this is, this is no more a treatable, benign problem. Uh, this is a malignant problem. Uh, when you define a malignant disease, it's a, it's a disease which is disabling and cannot be treated. And this is what we are producing when we are making the wrong decisions. And that's unfortunately due to the lack of appreciation and uh, uh, the knowledge about what micro neurosurgery can do. So when we talk about approaches, whether through the cavernous sinus or otherwise, when it comes to aneurysms, there's always mentioning about complexity and the risk and so forth. Well, I, I title this coming from uh, my other lecture, which is on cavernous sinus, when we talk about complexity and simplicity of it, it applies to the basilar apex. And the complexity and simplicity of the basilar apex uh, aneurysm treatment is really a kind of a discussion which comes down to a very predominant problem that is true to a lot of things which we deal with on a daily basis uh, that have been taken away from their best treatment. And that is the absence of the knowledge about how advanced surgery in, in and around the cavernous sinus and how safe it became 
and what is its real potential. And that is, it's almost like a dark area to a lot of people. It's very sad that I live every day in the cavernous sinus. Last week we did three cases and with beautiful results. And this is not because, you know, I'm a better surgeon or, or we can do something that somebody else cannot do. It's because we did our homework and this is something that's possible. And when you think about it as it is possible to do something, then that's how you can achieve the ability to do it. Now, where the problem comes from, this is a, a good example of a recent uh, meta-analysis. This is uh, in published 2020 in World Neurosurgery on basal apex aneurysm. And look at the conclusions here. The stent-assisted coiling had a higher rate of complete occlusion than uh, the uh, and lower rate of aneurysms compared with coiling. Comparative analysis were performed. Microsurgical technique remained the most morbid treatment, which is really sad that there hasn't been publication anyway, which except very few, and one of which is my publications and Michael, Dr. Lawton's publications, and they actually have very good results. And their conclusion adds up some old uh, publications to really drag the, the, the outcome down. However, they admit that the best rate of complete occlusion and lowest rate of rehemorrhage and retreatment is microsurgery. So that it's clear to me that microsurgery is the most durable and the most curable treatment. However, the idea that it's the most morbid, if we can change it, and it is changed in the right hands, then it is the superior outcome and the superior option. So there is a lot of trends and they're very popular and they can cause a lot of pressures and especially to the young people who haven't even seen the basilar artery in some training and it's forcing you to conform to a different modality of treatment and we have to resist it because the person who is suffering is that case that i started with which is the email that says another terrible coil case and if i would show you what i have it is it's a long list of them and if we failed in the past, it's okay. Failure is not against success. It's part of success. When we fail, it's an opportunity to improve. And that's how we can come up with better options. So instead of talking about complexity and simplicity, complexity comes from ignorance and simplicity comes from knowledge. If you know enough, things become simple. And that's how we can solve a lot of our difficult problems and as always i like to thank my mentors it's always important to appreciate them and not to think that you are the one who did something on your own and if you accept this then you can improve better in the future uh, starting with dr al mefti and uh, evandro uh, bless his heart who taught me a lot about aneurysms, like he taught a lot of people, including uh, one of the speakers, uh, Ferris, like he mentioned, uh, and uh, Professor Dolink. And of course, it's all under the umbrella of the micro neurosurgery of Professor Yazid. We all have our mentors, but I was lucky to have those, and I took every advantage of it. And the, what's common to them is they they all have the same thinking. Nothing is impossible. What's impossible is the ignorance. And But again, the property they have is they are hardworking. Nothing that you can achieve in a big way is something that is comes just by being talented or being skilled. You have to work hard to achieve your goal. And the way to do it is to go back to basics and stay the course 
And it's easy to give up. You can do one case and you say it is difficult. A difficult case is the case that we don't know enough how to do it. And I can prove it very quickly. I had cases 15 years ago. I thought they were very difficult. Nowadays, I don't see the difficulty. Why? You stay the course and you know more. So it all goes back to anatomy. If Al Mefti was here, if Yazagil was here, if Evander was here, they will put a slide with 10 like uh, items that starts number one as anatomy, number two anatomy, and number 10 is anatomy. We have to master the basics, which is the anatomy and the surgical anatomy and how to approach things. And when it comes to the basilar apex and the interpeduncular fossa, you need to know a, a detailed amount of knowledge of how to handle the anatomy in this region. And if you cannot see all this by looking just at one spot like the posterior clinoid, and you should be able to see all what's around it, then you're not ready to operate and to do things which may be deemed complex. And then in that case, you end up having failures and you end up doing incomplete jobs and you end up having bad outcomes. And that's how we shy away from doing something which we know it's more curable and more durable than any other option still nowadays. We do have our challenges. We have cases that we may not be able to overcome, but we can overcome them if we stay the course in the future. So use failure every time as an opportunity so we can do a perfect job and that's how we should handle any complex problem whether basilar aneurysms or cavernous tumors or a difficult AVM and so on. So if you look at vascular cases that are can be treated with surgery there's a long list of them which are still best treated <clears throat> by a good experienced surgeon. Giant, very small, MCA, mass effect, wide neck, a young age where clipping is more durable. And then the hemodynamic stress location where basilar are located is, is something to look into because you don't see a lot of publications with endovascular treatment because they fail. Nobody wants to talk about their failure as common as uh, their successes in a way. So aneurysms like this which are wide base like the case i've shown you this is even more difficult than the one they coiled it is clippable you can reconstruct it well and when a surgery superior i would quote here evandro surgery becomes superior when done at a superior level and it's it's simple you think about a convexity meningioma Everybody will say, I can do a convexity meningioma. Why? Because they know the anatomy. They know how to do it. Because, and they can even indicate it to, to patients who are asymptomatic if they're young. Why? Because they feel they can give a superior outcome compared to even the natural history. So if we can do surgery, which is at a very high level, it will become a superior option. And you can see it. A surgeon who is comfortable and experienced feels like surgery is the best option in his hands or her hands. But when they're not, that's when they shy away and go somewhere else. So the indications are really very operator dependent. But in absolute terms, we know that microsurgery at this point of time it's more curable and more durable, and it should not be morbid or more morbid than other options. And that's where we have to improve it. And that's where we come to what we can do surgically. And this is an example. This is a case with, which is not very complex. And if you coil this, and I'll show you other examples, you, you're buying yourself a potential problem. So the approach I use you know, there are many approaches. Uh, Ferris mentioned something. Everybody feels what's comfortable to them. 
I have used all these approaches. I know how to, to do all of them. But I will put it in a, in a, in a different kind of a context. If you have a cake which has layers of cream inside, <coughs> you have a cream on top and you have a cherry on top, that's a complete cake. Now, some may eat a dry cake, some may eat a cake with one layer of cream, some may eat a, late, a cake with two layers of cream and on the top, and some may or may not have a cherry. So all surgical approaches are <coughs> one of those options. <coughs> but I can tell you, when you do the pretemporal transcavernous approach, you get the whole cake. And then you can choose how much of it you want to eat. You don't have to eat the whole thing, but you have a complete approach. And I grant you, anybody who masters it can see the advantage, the increased safety. Because if you think about aneurysm surgery, what makes an aneurysm clipping safe? Number one is exposure. If you can see around the aneurysm, you can see the neck well, you can see the perforators, you can see all the parent vessels, your success jumps to 90%. And the most common cause of problems in an aneurysm is when you throw the aneurysm clip and you haven't seen enough. And if you, any experienced surgeon will know that. And that's why anything short of a wide exposure, you're compromising. You may be lucky, you may have gained experience, but it's always gonna be on the expense on the patient on a certain complications. So if you have all the weapons, why go to war with one or two bullets? Always go with all the options. Now, grant you, when you have enough experience, you may get away and you may be able to see around and you can do a lot of things, maybe 85, 90% of the times. But we have to start thinking, what is the approach that can work in almost every case, whether complex or not. And even a simple case, like Ferris showed aneurysms, it doesn't matter where it is small or big, where it is high or low. You have to have the approaches that can widen all these windows whenever you need it. Sometimes you don't need much, and sometimes you need a lot. But even a small aneurysm, if you don't have enough approach or wide approach to see it. You're gonna make it a complex, difficult aneurysm. And on the other hand also, you cannot go in assuming that the case is gonna be in your favor. Ferris showed some pictures. I got a lot of them to show, but he's already showed some. The third nerve is kissing the carotid. In another case, there is a highway between the third nerve and the carotid. And the incisura in different patients is different. You know, the same epidural hematoma, one patient will herniate, the other patient is awake and talking. Why? Because they have different normal anatomy. There is favorable anatomy and there is unfavorable anatomy. And if you do your case with the assumption that it's gonna be good for favorable anatomy. Even the most simple aneurysm can become a very complex aneurysm because the anatomy leading to it is not good. And I sometimes am surprised then when some colleagues will go up and show a, an approach and, and they say, this is the only approach I do. Well, I can tell you, this is very inexperienced and naive because it just tells you they've had problems because they categorize cases as difficult and not difficult. When you have the case that widens the approach, then the percentage of a difficult case number drops significantly. And that's what needs to be kept in mind in approaching problems. There is there's this competition now who can make a smaller craniotomy. It is ridiculous. We don't treat bone, we treat the brain. And it's, it's time to get out, this out of our mind and start doing the right thing for patients. I have not seen any patients of mine 
complained about how long their incision is. Remember, patients, people pay money to have an incision to do plastic surgery. And I don't think they mind having brain surgery with a larger incision if you can cure them. So the approach I use is, is, is a modification of the pterional approach. Everything is like a modification of pterional approach. And what we do is a wide opening so that you can mobilize the flap down. The zygoma is exposed. The, me the reason for this is to to take the temporalis muscle and drop it into this notch so that it's away. And when you look from this window, that's where I stopped doing the orbital part, the COZ part. Occasionally, I may take the, the zygoma, push it down if a patient has a big muscle and I want to look upward because our view comes from here, not from here. If you're coming from here, you're really having a narrow uh, corridor to get to that region. And then you have to have a wide temporal approach. And actually, Yazagil himself described it. He said, you know, the, the, when he did basilar, he opened more on the temporal side. He recognized it early. And the paper that uh, uh, <coughs> Ferris described about Evandro, the pretemporal approach, he described the same, but the pretemporal Evandro did was the intradural uh, type. And I know the last few years, he and I have been working together and on a lot of our courses, and he has started doing more the uh, the extradural approach because it really gives you a much more enhanced uh, window in a way. And then the craniotomy you can see is more temporal. And once we get it out of the way, the next phase is really to expose the pretemporal extradural window because removal of the clinoid and mobilizing the third nerve and if you need to mobilize the fourth nerve you have you know all the options needed to widen your window if you remove the clinoid you get access to the posterior clinoid you get access to the opposite p1 you get access to as low as possible and if the window between the third nerve and the carotid intradurally is tight, then you release the ring and the proximal uh, bands. I don't call them rings because there's only one ring, which is the distal, which is a dural ring. You can release all this and mobilize the carotid completely out of the way, mobilize the third nerve out of the way. And then you have a very large window looking at the interpeduncular fossa. And if you remove the posterior clinoid, you can go down. And if you need to go further down, then you mobilize the fourth nerve. And then you have all the options in front of you. Like in this case, third nerve, the PCOM, the basilar, that's the window. And then once you get this in front of you, you can immediately assess how to get full access to this point. Removal of the posterior clinoid so you can get access to the basilar, and then the PCOM cutting. And uh, uh, I have to mention that really this this was also described and popularized for basilar by Professor Yazagil. And uh, we published our experience with it. Uh, like uh, Ferris said, you had, most of the time you can cut it proximal to the uh, P1, P2 junction, but you can look at that paper to see it more but it does enhance your view to where you can see this wide window and if you notice here there is a clip on the p1 on the opposite side here on the left and there's a clip on the peak on the basilar and this is where the pecom was it was obstructing the view and look at the view you get when you do this approach this becomes like a bifurcation aneurysm or an, an mc aneurysm this is what makes this surgery less morbid, an enhanced approach, an enhanced view, and you have no blind spots. So this is the case, and you can see the opening, and I'll try to save time here. And this is then we open the sylvium fissure, as described by Yazergil, and then you open the corridor going down to the third nerve, 
this is the third nerve now being opened. Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. So I will only show one case, and this which will show, describe the approach, or maybe one more case to show a low-lying basilar. So this is the approach, and you can see how it's widening the window. And now you can see how much space I have. This is posterior. This is a clip on the basilar, a clip on the P1. And I can see all the perforators, and I collapse the aneurysm. And I have a full view of my clip going in. So let me skip this. This is the view you can get, and, and this is the result. Now, imagine this is a case which was sent to me again from another colleague, 35-year-old subarachnoid energy in 2011 coiled and recoiled 2017. Now again recalling. One, they want to have an opinion of what to do. Well, this is the original aneurysm. It is a shame that this aneurysm now is a malignant aneurysm. There's so many cases like this. And the publications show clearly that the problem is always coming from aneurysm that are wide and location at the basilar tip, they recur. So, I will skip this. These are the examples that of problems that I see every day. Look at these. All these problems. This is a stroke in the brainstem. Another case like this. Stroke in the brainstem. We cannot accept this and start doing a science out of the failure and then not talk about other options that can be used. We are lowering the bar a lot, like Michelangelo says, and we are really uh, not achieving what we want to achieve. In surgery, a perfect job will give you a perfect result. And we just have to perfect the job in a way. So let me go to one case, and then I will conclude. I have this is a case which is very low lying. You see it? And in this case, you can do a full transcavernous approach. And what we did is we opened the Meckel's cave. We mobilized third and fourth nerve. This is the fourth nerve being mobilized. Third nerve. Carotid artery, sixth nerve. You see it's avascular. This is a an exercise in anatomy. That's all what it is. And I will show you now removal of the petroclaval junction. This is fourth and third nerve mobilized to the left. And look at the view you get for the aneurysm in this case. And that makes clipping of this aneurysm very quick and very easy. So I will skip and go to my conclusions. We treated about, it's more than 180 now with this approach. And or, or one of its variations. And this is the outcome of these patients. 83% of ruptured aneurysms in three months to one year are independent, zero to two on the modified Rankin scale. You can see the outcomes. When, when it comes to the uh, unruptured aneurysm, it's even higher. 89% on discharge, 95% in three months to a year with the 0.5 mortality using this approach. And we had three which we couldn't clip, two of which had coils in them. Three of our series regrew, which is about 1.5%, compared to 30 and 40%. Two of them, we re-clipped them. And the oculomotor palsy, 
recovery is 98% if you know how to handle the optic nerve. And, you know, when you master something, it becomes simple. If you go unprepared, you're going to have problems. And I will skip this. This is Dr. De Oliveira's message always for success. Be passionate, determined. Keep the courage and have your inner sense and good judgment. And with Professor Yazagil, you know, he's always surprised how people shy away from trying something new. He puts it as courage. You have to have courage, but not reckless courage. It is judicious courage based on professional competence, which means you go and do your homework, you learn something, and then you come prepared and then you can achieve better. So I hope for, for everybody listening, there's a lot of promise and I'm very optimistic, unlike a lot of people, about the future of microneurosurgery because a treatment is not the best treatment when it works well in 80% or 50% or 90% or whatever. The best treatment is the one that always works and up to close to 100% of the times. It is wrong to play statistics with our patients to say, this is a good treatment that works in 80% of the times. Well, me in my clinic, I'm seeing the 20%, the failures. And if I catch them before, they would have been included in my 95%. And that's better for the patients. So I'll stop here and I hope I was useful to some and thank you for the opportunity. Professor Ali, Chris, thank you very much for your great presentation. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you with us and sharing some of your of your experience. Um, how uh, wide must the cilium fissure must be dissected in the, in, in the extra drill approach? Well, the sylvian fissure is a part and parcel of the uh, approach. Like I said initially, the, uh, the uh, terional approach and its variations, one of which is really the transcavernous approach, if you think about it. We just add adding more uh, space at the depth on the outside as we go in opening the sylvian fissure is important for uh, the any aneurysm which is at the clinoid or above the clinoid process. If it is below the clinoid, like the last case I showed, where you go full transcavernous, you don't need even to see the brain at all. On that, uh, you know, we didn't have time to show it. But in that case, you don't see the brain. You just go under the temporal lobe through the tentorium to the posterior fossa, and then you can manage it. So opening the fissure is, is an important part of this uh, approach. Uh, obviously, uh, to what extent to open it, uh, usually it's, in, it's a kind of a standard way in most cases, which is starting from the Lehman insulae and going down and widely exposing it and then uh, dissecting the temporal lobe away from the uh, uh, the medial, the lateral aspect of the carotid. Just like uh, Michael mentioned, in that area, you have to uh, look at where the anterior choroidal coming out. Usually, once you dissect the arachnoid, you can split it away from the anterior choroidal. Uh, what needs to be att attentive to is sometimes there is a small branch coming from the uh, proximal M1. And if it's a big branch and it is short and tight, it can give you problems if the aneurysm is high, even if you open the fissure. And this is where the real advantage of the transcavernous approach, because then you can go more inferior and lateral, because the pterioner, the the full transcavernous approach is a combination of a pterional approach, of a pretemporal approach, and a subtemporal approach. You can get all these windows at the same time, 
and then you can avoid any uh, blockage. Now, sometimes if it's a small branch and it's tight, you may want to coagulate and cut it because if, if you keep more tension on the temporal lobe, it can avulse and bleed. So opening the fissure is, is a part of this operation uh, unless it's a very low uh, aneurysm, then you really don't have to open the fissure with this approach that I do because you go more fully transcavernous in a way. Can you still hear me? Uh, there's another question about uh, uh, what what tips can you give us to mobilize the third, the fourth, and the fifth nerves in the okay. transcavernous approach? Okay, the the third nerve, uh, you have to uh, remove the clinoid because that's where the dissection starts, and you come medial to the clinoid, uh, medial to the third nerve. In the over the clinoidal segment of the carotid, there is a little membrane. I call it the orbitoclinoidal membrane, which is part of the uh, oculomotor carotid membrane, and you dissect it away from the third nerve. Now, and then you follow the third nerve as it enters into the dura, and uh, you have to cut uh, tangential to the nerve. Uh, you know, Ferris mentioned you cut longitudinally, which is not horiz horizontally or in a cross section to the nerve, which is true. But more than that, to be safe, you have to cut tangential in a longitudinal axis to the nerve, because even if you injure it, it's a surface injury, not a deep cut into it. And once you you have to free it really from the orbital fissure all the way down to the brainstem. And this will mobilize the nerve. And once the nerve is mobilized, then if you manipulate it, it will not be injured in a permanent way. It will be just a temporary palsy. And that's an important concept to know. This is true to all the nerves. The fourth nerve is the same. I always like to use the example of a, a string of a guitar. If the guitar string is tight, you will have music. If it is loose, you don't have music. And in this case, music is injury. If it is tight, then the pressure, and we did publish a, a paper by one of my fellow, Dr. Basma, you should look it up. He did a beautiful job, studied the physics of the force and pressure relationship uh, using a, a pressure gauge. If you put the same amount of force, how much pressure is exerted on the nerve if it is loosened versus tight? and it was much less. And that's how you mobilize it. Of course, you have to release it from the arachnoid. A word of caution, the third nerve, you don't want to manipulate it proximal to the brainstem. If you go to the lab and look at the anatomy, the nerve, when it comes out from the brainstem, it has like four or five little kind of fascicles. Try not to get there. This becomes a problem with superior cerebellar aneurysm. If they are large, they are digging inside the root of the third nerve. Try your best not to manipulate there because the injury is more permanent if you are more proximal. When you're distal, it can, it can handle it better. The fourth nerve, you just have to follow it from the superorbital fissure. Once it enters the tentorium, don't continue. Stop, open the dura, look at it from inside, and then bridge the dura, and then you can mobilize it and remove the dura from around it. Six nerve, you don't need to do anything for it in the full transcavernous approach. You just have to know where it is because you need to be medial to it when you cut the dura of the petroclival junction so you can look down towards the pons and the brainstem. So, and the V1, V2, V3 are out of the way for similar approaches. And this the beauty of this approach is not only used for, for uh, uh, basilar apex aneurysm. It's used to a whole list of uh, problems like tumors of the hypothalamus, craniopharyngiomas, uh, epidermoids, uh, pontine lesions, uh, mesencephalic lesions, um, chordomas, 
pituitary adenomas invading the cavernous sinus supracellular region. Last week, we were three days in a row in the cavernous sinus, working up and down that corridor for three different lesions, two in very invasive pituitary adenomas and one chordoma. So it is really a, it's a must that if you want to do good surgery around the brainstem and in the supracellular region that you know how to expose through the cavernous sinus. It's a, it's a highway that you're missing on. It's like, like you know, you're, you're, you, instead of uh, taking a bicycle, you're taking a, a rocket to go somewhere. You're going to get there faster and in a shorter period of time. Question, interesting one. Uh, what what would be your biggest advice when you face an acute rupture aneurysm with a hemorrhage and, and an angry brain? What would would prefer your, your approach? Well, <laughs> the first advice is uh, angry brain is a is not a problem the problem is an angry surgeon so the first thing you need to do is to be able to control yourself and your nerves this is what decides the outcome of any rupture the most common cause of a bad outcome of a rupture is not the rupture is what the surgeon does when the rupture occurs how to handle it a rupture is bleeding. You just have to make sure that you and your nurse have a plan coordinated. You should take your nurse to the lab and make a rupture and show them how to deal with it. They have to be able to hand you one large suction. If you are holding the suction with the left hand, you take the suction with the right hand, the big one. You put it in quickly and then you take another suction. They change it on the left. So I always have two suctions ready, especially if you anticipate rupture. And then once you are controlling the blood into the suction, you are fine. The worst thing to do is to try to, to, uh, to do things fast, to try to clip or to stop the bleeding. The first thing you need to do is to remember what was the last thing you were doing when the rupture happened. This is your best clue to what you should be doing. Then you know how to look for the rupture. Now, you should never get to a position where you are manipulating around the aneurysm and you have a rupture before you have proximal control. And this is a mistake that uh, the, always done. And when I hear people saying they have 15, 20% of the times intraop rupture, I'm, I'm shocked. I barely have you know, every year I may have one rupture, which is a little early, and never before I get proximal control. If you look at the surgeries we do, uh, in my, you know, a lot of my fellows, you are here, Arturo, and others, you rarely see a rupture in my cases because we get proximal control. We, we cause a rupture ourselves. I have what I call a controlled ooze. I put a clip on the proximal and distal control, then I can manipulate. If it bleeds, not a big deal. A little bleeding and you put the clip, but you can see everything. And uh, so an angry brain should not be a problem if you know how to handle the skull base. Uh, always put, you can put a ventriculostomy to drain the spinal fluid, open lamina terminalis to release the brain. I have Rarely in the last 15 years, I have one or two cases that were so difficult that I couldn't advance the case and I stopped. But always there is a way to relax the brain. You can give diuretics, but you always have to go where spinal fluid is located. Sometimes it's impacted in the posterior fossa. You have to open the liliquids membrane to drain the fluid and so on. The most common cause of a very difficult brain that cannot be handled, in my experience, is usually a patient who had multiple bleeds, multiple hemorrhages. These patients have bled three to four days before. They stayed at home. They bled another time, 24 hours before. They were not in good shape. And then next day they bleed again and they come in bad shape. And the other problem is when you have an impacted ventricular system those are difficult brains. 
And this is common with uh, pericolosal aneurysms. A lot of times they bleed in the ventricle in a big way, and then you have no CSF to drain because the ventricles are impacted. In those cases, I go through the corpus callosum and I evacuate the clot so I can circulate the spinal fluid for both ventricles uh, if the patient is still salvageable. Uh, but uh, again, the if you follow the, the rules, if you know your anatomy, proximal control early, you should not have these catastrophic uh, conditions and situation. And unfortunately, this is what led the, you know, the endovascular option to become more prominent and to accuse the microsurgical option as being more morbid and uh, not a good option. So uh, again, be prepared, go watch somebody who mastered how to deal with a rupture, go to a lab. For those of you who've been to our lab, you have the Aboud model. Dr. Aboud has a beautiful model where you can simulate the rupture and we walk you through it and you learn it. You can do 20 or 100 ruptures in the lab before you do it, you deal with it in a patient. Um, another question about uh, what, uh, in which cases do you decide to sacrifice the PCOM to make some space in order to approach the basilar tip aneurysm? Yeah, well, number one, the PCOM has to be sm small, the P, the PCOM has to be smaller than P1. Uh, if it is larger than P1 or equal to P1, then I will not take it because then it is, it, uh, you know, you, you will compromise the blood flow. If it's smaller, then, then I will take it. When do I take it? I usually assess it. I look and see the aneurysm and I see if, uh, sometimes I can see the neck, but if I am moving the clip in and out, uh, it looks like I'm going to be more dangerous. Then I need more space, then I will coagulate and cut it. And usually you look for a perforator-free zone, most commonly closer to P1, P2. Now, I have one or two cases I cut it at the carotid because there was a lot of uh, uh, branches all over except next to the takeoff from the carotid. It was one, maybe two cases, I don't remember. And there was a couple, I cut them in the middle. I don't like to cut in the middle because you're closer, close to the mammillary artery uh, that goes to the mammillary uh, uh, bodies. Uh, but then, then you can, uh, most of the time, more distal, uh, close to P1, P2 segment. So usually I assess it. Now, fortunately, when the PCOM is fetal, it is rare that you have basilar aneurysm. It's not as common, um, which is because obviously you don't have a lot of flow going into the artery because the flow is more taken by the fetal PCOM. So the ch I have seen very few cases, maybe one or two, where there is a large fetal PCOM and the basilar aneurysm. It's, it's rare. about uh, what's your opinion about the hybrid uh, neurosurgeon about uh, people who's training in an endovascular and vascular neurosurgery uh, what what are your your opinions about this well uh, if you are busy very busy in both and that's the only thing you're doing and you have a good training I can imagine it being a possibility but the trend now is not, I am, I'm really not impressed by the outcomes of the hybrid idea so far. Uh, I can tell you one of the most, uh, the best uh, hybrid surgeons uh, that I know are the two guys who work with me because they trained with me, they do the surgery and they went and did endovascular. And when we have a case, if they feel nervous or they feel they uncomfortable and they start thinking of endovascular and they show it to me and I say, well, why don't you do it and I'll help you with it. I think long term, this is a young person, it's a clippable aneurysm and I can make you comfortable with it. And in this case, they decide to clip the aneurysm 
And the next time they have the same case, they'll call me. They said, I have a similar case. If you're around, just come by. I'm going to go ahead and clip it. Why? Because they clipped it before. They gained from my experience, and now they can okay. proceed with it. So uh, okay. in, in my experience, uh, what, most what, of the what, hybrid colleagues have not been, you know, uh, real hybrids, to be honest with you. Uh, if you want to think of a hybrid who does both equally Third. Third and as good, uh, because a lot of them uh, are doing less uh, surgery in a way. Been, but it's like possible. <laughs> well, you know, you can, if you're asking questions, you can ask Michael this question too. Uh, the, uh, they asked me about the concept of the hybrid uh, neurosurgeon who does uh, endovascular and uh, microsurgery. And uh, Michael has even uh, experience firsthand with it. He can tell you his opinion. I gave them my opinion. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I, I would have loved to have heard your opinion. I think I know it, um, and I think I agree with it. Uh, the um, I, I'm a believer that you have to really subspecialize if you want to uh, maximize your skills and reach the top of your, um, your uh, expertise. Um, I think you just need to be absolutely 100% committed. and. Um, uh, I think if you try and do both, uh, it's a dilution of your time and your focus. Um, I think um, what has worked better in my practice is to build a team, a team of uh, excellent uh, partners on all sides of the uh, therapeutic spectrum. So, um, you know, I have uh, Dr. Albuquerque, I have Dr. Ducre. Um, we have a, a wonderful team and a great working relationship. Okay, what do you think about a hybrid or Hybrid or? Yes. Well, uh, there there is one in the last maybe ten years. I have one case which I I thought it was it would have been good to have a hybrid OR. And uh, and my OR is about uh, twenty meters away from the angio suite, so we just kept the patient intubated and move it to the angio suite. Now to do something at the same time. Um, both endo and uh, surgery. Uh, I usually am able to get proximal control. Most people who like the uh, hybrid is because they ask for an proximal control in the uh, in the neck or for the basilar. I have no problem finding proximal control, and I like to have proximal control myself. I like to have the clip myself. Uh, I did, did try uh, one time an endovascular proximal control and ended up with a catastrophe. So uh, one problem will kind of make you shy away from it. So, uh, but uh, I'm sure it will be helpful. Uh, Dr. Almefti showed me a couple of cases of tumors he used it in. Uh, but uh, for vascular, I don't see how often you can use it. For especially for aneurysm surgery, it's uh, maybe with time we can have more cases. But uh, I, I don't like to have too many hands and too many places to control an aneurysm. Uh, what's your opinion about the uh, hybrid OR? Uh, it was the the question we were talking with Professor Chris. Yeah, I I am. Um, I'm not a huge fan. I think um, um, you, you decide which way you're going to go. You're going to either operate or you're going to treat the patient endovascularly. And um, I think um, people with hybrid OVRs come up with some crazy notions of how to treat uh, aneurysms and AVMs. And I think um, it's just, it's architecture muddling thought. And so you have to define your thoughts clearly up front and then stick with your plan. Give us uh, top three advices for the young neurosurgeons uh, to master our practice. I think when it comes to basilar aneurysms, I, I would say um, number one is um, being very uh, comfortable with uh, Sylvian Fisher split. I think um, probably the most important thing you can do 
to uh, improve your outcomes and your uh, your results um, with Basler's is really um, splitting the Sylvia and Fisher uh, in a very clean and maximal way. Uh, the second thing I would say is um, um, being really comfortable with the little tricks that uh, increase your exposure. And by that, I mean posterior clinoidectomy, um, um, anticlinoidectomy if necessary, um, mobilizing the temporal lobe and all those little tricks that open the window. And lastly, I think um, when you uh, really have mastered all the other things, the third is the transcavernous. I think um, Ali has really made a, a great argument for uh, the transcavernous approach uh, for the really complex uh, aneurysm. And I think um, um, it makes a lot of sense. And I think um, if you want to have your complete uh, quiver filled with the right arrows, that's the third step. I was enjoying watching that last case he showed. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Arturo, is this a question for all of us, or you have another question? You hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you decide, or which are the main considerations to decide the left side or right side for tip basilar artery aneurysm? For this question, for whom? We may ask uh, Michael, because... Uh, you know, he, he talked the least. We'd like to hear him. <laughs> so um, I, I go um, from the right side uh, uh, unless there's some reason not to. So um, uh, the right side is the non-dominant side uh, in the vast majority of cases. I think that um, if there's going to be any temporal low morbidity, you want that to be on the non-dominant side. Uh, it's a midline aneurysm, so most of the time um, that's fine. But the things that drive me to the left would be, you know, um, uh, a fetal PCA on the um, on the uh, right side that I think might get in the way, or the slant of the neck, some tilt of the aneurysm, uh, other aneurysms that are on the left that might need to be treated. Um, you know, I think uh, um, there's no reason not to go on the left because you, you very rarely get a temporal lobe problem, but I, I think. Um, it's good. It's good uh, surgical hygiene just to stay away from that if um, if you can. Questions, professor. Uh, what about your experience with uh, uh, perforator aneurysms or in fenestrated uh, uh, basilar arteries aneurysm? Well, perforator artery aneurysms. Um, uh, I've seen. A, a they're ex exceptionally rare. I've seen quite a few of them, um, and we've reported on these. Um, they're um, very interesting aneurysms. They're basically fusiform uh, distal dilations of the perforating arteries, and the um, they're elusive. A lot of times you, uh, well, we had one maybe two weeks ago where the angiogram was done. It was read as negative because you have to look very carefully at the delayed angiographic phase to, uh, to actually see the aneurysm. Um, when you find it, um, they're actually pretty easy to treat. You just go in and you, um, um, you occlude it. The problem is that they're very difficult to clip without compromising the perforator. So, um, you know, a lot of times you end up having to take that perforator, but often these present with subarachnoid hemorrhage, and so you, you're forced to. If you feel like you can't, or if let's say you take it and you have a change in the um, uh, the neuromonitoring, then there are other things you can do. Uh, that case that we did last week, I was able to reconstruct a neck and save the flow. Uh, on other cases, uh, you might do a, um, a, uh, a clip wrapping where you get um, muslin or Gore-Tex and do a clip wrapping around uh, these things. So there are options, but in general, um, they're rare and they uh, just need to be trapped. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Lutton, for Ali Krish. What do you think about the subtemporal approach? Um, I, I think it is good for a certain types of aneurysms uh, if it is uh, well uh, kind of uh, positioned. 
and in a case where you know the the temporal lobe can be relaxed in acute ruptures um, you're really paying a price and uh, with the retraction of the temporal lobe significantly especially if you have a very uh, voluminous brain in a way i have used it in some cases it's very quick when you use it for the right case uh, um, I know you are Ernest Samey and of course uh, uh, Professor Drake has used it. Uh, you know, any approach you take, um, if you master it, you'll be able to to manipulate around it and, and you're no more operating with your vision, you're operating with your brain, so you can achieve a lot. But, uh, but it's, it has limitations and if you look at uh, Professor Drake's book, he clearly mentioned that uh, the best approach is the one that will not only go subtemporal, but it will combine subtemporal, uh, perioneal, and more. That's exactly how he puts it. So he realized that they, he has limitations. If the aneurysm is very low, they had difficulty because you cannot get proximal control. If its aneurysm is very high, you need to retract the temporal lobe significantly, and that can be a problem. So. Uh, you know, some sometimes some surgeons feel like this is the best option in their hands. In that case, you have to do what's best in your hands. But be open-minded to acquire, you know, new knowledge and uh, uh, so you can advance your or increase your options. The subtemporal approach, uh, uh, I prefer the subtemporal approach in the in the basilar tip anyways, yeah, high reading, low reading, and normal reading. I use the subtemporal approach to to uh, uh, to have a, a lateral view, the relation between the the posterior column perforating arteries and the neck of the aneurysm, uh, and the relation the column perforating with uh, arteries, with the tip and the end. You know, Arturo, I'll give you an example. Like I said, I used the, the uh, approach. When did I use it? It was an unruptured case. A lady who is uh, like in her 60s, she was uh, skinny and uh, and uh, the aneurysm was not big and it was just above the clinoid and that's a perfect setup it's projecting superiorly that uh, take, took like 45 minutes to do it uh, because it has the ideal conditions but again like i mentioned earlier this is a favorable anatomy case but not every case is like this okay thank you so much professor Chris. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor Juan Luis Gomez Amador from Mexico. Professor Gomez Amador, do you have any comment or question for the presenters? Oh uh, yeah, sure. Good night. I want to congratulate for both your presentations. It was very enlightening, and I, I want to to ask. Uh, back in 2001, when I was living Little Rock, Professor Yeshakli said to me, "Now you need to go to Parneski." At that time, Professor Parneski in Mines. He was using the endoscope in order to reach some area. The axial view of a microscope was not enough to have a, a, a complete and integral vision, especially for some cases of aneurysm. Uh, so I have two, two, two considerations. First one, do you think there is a place for the use of uh, some uh, endoscopic view for some aneurysms? First one. And second one, talking about uh, basilar aneurysms, uh, there are some uh, transclival approaches do, do, doing by, by the nose, endoscopic and nasal approach. Do you think <clears throat> there could be some case uh, uh, to be treated by this route? I, wa I want to hear the opinion of all of you. Well, I can tell you that um, okay. <clears throat> I, I don't think that there's a um, a role to play for endoscopic clipping of basilar aneurysms through the nose. Um, I've seen uh, very good endonasal surgeons um, try to do this, and I've watched their videos. And what I take away is that 
by the time you do that exposure and you get your instruments in, you basically can put the clip on in one way with very limited flexibility in terms of your angle of application, your all the different variables that make for a good clipping. And um, when you're that limited in that critical of an area, it's just not worth it. Um, I think that the open surgical options are far superior. I think uh, even some of the endovascular options are superior. So an endonasal approach is, uh, I think, a, a, uh, a technique in search of an indication there. And um, I, I, I just don't like what I see. Um, so um, I, don't, uh, I don't think it's a wise way for us to go. The only reason to do those is for um, cosmetic or minimally invasive uh, advantages. And this is not an, an an aneurysm where you want to sacrifice um, outcome for cosmesis. The, <laughs> endos the endoscope is another story. I mean, I, I think that um, with uh, some surgical confidence around the, the apex, you can manipulate tissues and get the views that you need. Uh, I don't think that an endoscope dramatically helps you with that because it comes in at many of the same angles and it, it's such a tight space that it um, is equally difficult. I, I haven't found it to be very valuable in my um, in my practice. Dr. Krish? Yeah, I, I agree with Michael. You know, when you see a case, it's presented in conferences and it's a successful and it looks nice, it's good visualization. Nobody can argue with success, but we have to be prepared for the more complex and for the mishaps the problems that can occur. If you have a major problem with bleeding and you, your instrument cannot move except within a one and a half to two centimeter uh, width in a way, uh, you, you're, you're, you're challenging yourself. Uh, and uh, again, you know, if it's my head of one of my loved ones, uh, I would like uh, you know, Michael Lawton to be at his best and relaxed and can have many options except of one or two options. Uh, then I would then I would proceed. Uh, if it's my patient, uh, I want to have the best full control options and not take any chances. Again, uh, there may be select cases which are small. Uh, like I said earlier, we have to make plans which work every time and save every time. We cannot take chances. Uh, uh, no matter how, you know, the concept is, has to be followed. The, the, uh, you know, this is, this is really important. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be done uh, with an endoscope, but we have to be careful because like uh, Michael said, uh, uh, to use uh, uh, the endoscope uh, by kind of uh, forcing it to search for an indication, uh, it may not be wise. Now, you may say, well, in my hand, it's much riskier to do it, the cranial approach. That's why I'm doing it. If, you, if you're the only option and you think this is the best thing, that's fine. But there is relative terms and absolute terms. We have to look at the absolute terms, not the relative terms. The relative terms, maybe it's better not to operate at all if you are in... Uh, unfortunately, one of the African countries, like I have some fellows who came, the best option is not to do anything in that case. That's a relative term. But is this the, the best option for the aneurysm when you have all the options available? The answer is no. So, in terms of using an endoscope, I don't know if, if, uh, if Juan was, uh, when he was in Little Rock, uh, if you remember, I had the Olympus microscope, which has an endoscope integrated, a nice small endoscope. I did use it, but I can t to look around. But like like Michael said, uh, when you have the experience, you, you can see really with your brain the anatomy, and and a lot of times you can put the temporary clips on and off, deflate the aneurysm, look around, and then you establish a three dimensional picture in your mind. Then your your uh, uh, your clips become like they have eyes in front of them and they have an endoscope on the tip of the clips because you can see with your brain and the clip becomes, uh, it has uh, vision in a way, you can see with it. Uh, 
I do have a couple of cases where it was a difficult corner that I put the endoscope. I made sure that I didn't catch a perforator. I can see that, but that has to be really a very small endoscope that can look around the corner <clears throat> and you have to be able to see both at the same time. In that case, that was a great microscope. It has picture in picture. You can see the endoscopic and microscopic picture through the same eyepiece. And unfortunately, they stopped uh, producing those uh, endoscopes. Yeah. Professor Ferris, what do you think about it? Well, Dr. Ferris, uh, uh, I have a nice vision, nice view with microscope. I don't experience, I don't have experience with endoscope. Uh, I uh, I perform, I use the, the basilar, most of the case, my case, with microsurgery. I don't have experience with the endoscope. Thank you very much, and congratulations again for your presentations. Professor Juan Luis Gomez Amador. And thank you so much, Professor Christ, Professor Ferres Chadab. And Professor Michael Lutton, it was a great pleasure to hear you, to hear your lectures, amazing lectures. Thank you very much. And fortunately, we have uh, we have seen a lot of, of COVID-19 from Professor Lutton, uh, uh, social media. So uh, we will we'll keep following you and, and see all your all your lectures over there. Thank you very much and keep uh, safe at your homes and hope uh, your families are okay. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Ali. Bye, Michael. Bye, bye. Very good much. To see you. Good to see you, Ferris and Michael. Good to see you again. Bye. Good to see you, guys. All right. Bye.